yeah, we're back on the drum. And in case you missed the last part of this series, here's what we've done to get up to this point. We started out by throwing the drum over in Tyson's machine and drilled and threaded some holes for some locating pins. Next, we took a big piece of aluminum, put it on top of our DVF 8000T, where we made a subplate for our shunk manual clamping system. Then we were able to take our material and set it right down on top of these manual units. So that's where we left off, and now we're ready to rough the entire shape of the drum. And you know, I wouldn't have to be doing this recap if you guys were already subscribed, because if you were, you would already have saw these videos and know that we're making this drum for Dan Palovich, who used to play for a little band called Panic at the Disco. And I gotta give it to Dan, because not only is he an awesome musician, he's actually a pretty good designer, because this drum is actually his creation. So props to you, Dan. But for real, you guys need to subscribe. The first tool is gonna to be a Kinemetal 5720 shoulder mill. It's gonna rough the outside and inside down to the top of the lugs that wrap around the OD of the part. The next tool is going to be a three quarter inch duo lock ball nose. In this video, we're taking you through the entire machining process of this operation. But in about a week from now, we're going to put out another video where we sit down at the computer and I show you exactly how to program some of these more difficult tool paths. So you can take your skills to the next level. And after it swarf mills the chamfers on the top of the part, it's gonna come in and rough the rest of the material on the ID all the way down. Now this is just gonna spiral around and around all the way down, but by doing it this way, I wanna be able to keep the tool short and then not have to use a very long tool. Then it's gonna come in on the OD and pick up where the first tool left off and rough around and around the part all the way down. Now this is gonna allow me to rough the shape of the part and do it all in one pass, essentially, or one axial depth, and just step over maybe 50 thousandths all the way down. Now, since these lugs on the outside has a vertical wall on the backside, I didn't want this tool to just drop all the way down once it reaches that point and full slot behind these lugs. So what I did is I created some surfaces that radius down to the part so it walks itself gradually down to the OD. So after it gets rid of this initial stock, then it can come back and rest rough behind each one of these lugs and get rid of that excess material. And after that, with just a couple of tool paths, we've got nearly this entire drum completely roughed. Now this tool was a little bit large to get around the radiuses around the lugs, so we're gonna have to come in with a smaller tool and do some rest roughing around these lugs to get rid of that excess stock. And with that, all the roughing is complete. Now we're gonna come in and start finishing. But I'm only gonna finish the ID. I'm not going to finish the OD on this operation. And you're gonna see why by the end of this video. But for finishing the ID, I'm gonna come in with that same three quarter inch dual lock ball nose. And that motion is just so smooth. You know, that is one of the reasons why I absolutely love a Siemens control. The way it handles high-speed machining, orientation smoothing, the fact that it looks like something that's from the 21st century and it's so easy to use, all of these things combined together just makes it an enjoyable experience to work on. And I say that because I actually wonder, why is a Siemens control not adopted more in the United States. You know, why have another manufacturer been the premier control for so many years? 
because when you look at that control versus something like this, it's literally like you're looking back into the 90s. Let me know in the comments below what would be some reasons that you would not put a machine with a Siemens control in your shop. But I can't wait to hear from you guys because personally, I've seen the power of these controls versus some of the others. And I just truly want you to know what I know and see what I see in these Siemens Cinemaric controls. I want to come back in with a smaller ball nose and do some more finishing around this ball. That ball nose is also going to swarf mill the chamfer around the top, as well as surface mill the fillets around the top of the part. Next, I'm gonna come in with a quarter inch end mill and helical mill the vent hole. Next, I'm gonna come back in with that three inch shell mill and semi finish around the top of the lugs. Now this is not taking it down to size. I'm still leaving 25,000 stock on here because I want this finished all together on the next operation. And again, you're gonna see why in the next video. Now we can come in and do our threaded holes. So we're gonna drill, chamfer, and thread mill these 1224 holes. But we gotta be careful and use shrink fit extensions for basically all of this because these holes are very close to this outer diameter. And I'm gonna go ahead and run through spindle coolant on this drill because the last thing I wanna do is end up catching a chip and breaking this drill when I only have one part to run. And speaking of coolant, I don't know if you guys know, but we actually partnered with Hennig and we replaced all of our high pressure units on our machines with the Hennig Veriflow high pressure system with programmable set points up to a thousand PSI. And so far we are absolutely loving this system. Now to thread these holes, I'm using a single point thread mill, which is gonna take longer than if I would have just tapped it but because these holes are so close to the diameter and these threads are also very deep, they wanted a at least a three times D thread depth. So I just chose to go with a single point thread mill. I know it's gonna add a little bit of cycle time, but it's gonna be a much safer process. The last thing I wanna do is I wanna come in with a one inch indexable end mill and mill a flat across the front of the part. This is what's gonna help me time this part when I flip it over to do the back side. Now, as you can see, we still got this hat of material on the bottom that we need to get rid of, as well as finish the entire outside. So I'm gonna need a way to time this when I flip it over. So by adding this flat, I have something I can indicate off of. And that's the last tool, so let's get in and see what it looks like. looking sick well the inside is not the outside the outside's looking like something barry would finish Ooh, sparkly no but seriously guys this thing is looking amazing i can't wait till dan sees this thing and this is one of those parts that you know that you make that looks so good that you don't want it to leave the shop you actually are sad when it leaves that's what this is going to end up being and i don't know if you can see this but right here around this rim i finished this radius with a different tool that I'm gonna use on this outside in the next operation. This tool right here. This thing is gonna be the secret weapon to making this drum steal the show. And like I said, guys, in the next video, we're gonna be going through the entire programming process that I used on this drum. I'm gonna give you those skills to up your game in your next project. We'll see you on the next one.